How many here today have noticed that the world's a changing place? Any of you notice that? Oh, good. It's not just me. That's good. How many people here at one time or another have tried to change their lives for the better? Any of you out here trying to change your lives for the better? That's good. Now, I'm, I'm, here's the test question. How have we tried to change our lives? What do we do? Somebody tell me something you've done to change your life. Work harder. Work harder. Read. Read. What else? Go on a diet. <laughs> Read your rules. Help others. Think Pray. Pray. Think differently. Think differently. What else? Go to church. Go to church. You see, there's, there's a lot of things we can do. And people really do want to be changed for the better, don't they? At least usually. Sometimes we exercise or diet, we go to school, we read a book, we go to counselors, we do all the things that you mentioned. Now, you all got a bulletin when you came in today. I want you to take it out. I want you to reach into that chair in front of you and uh, grab a pencil. Well, okay. That row over there needs some help with a pencil. I throw my pen at you, but anyway, because because I want you to do something really important today with your bulletin. Because I know how you use these bulletins, and Robin works hard to create the bulletins. Mostly, we pick them up and put them in the recycle bin. But today, you're going to write something really important on it so you can get it home. What are you supposed to do with it when, when, after you've got your dresser? Okay, no. What about your dresser? Laminate it. Oh. Well, you can laminate it. <laughs> make it shiny. Anyway, I want you to ask yourself a question. Okay, I want you to ask yourself a question. This small group's getting out of control. <laughs> Looking for some change. That's right. Ask yourself this question. I'm going to pose it in two or three ways so you can understand it. But what is it about yourself that you would like to change? If you could change one thing about yourself, what it would be? What would it be? Isn't that a great question? If you could change one thing about yourself, what it would be? What would it be? One thing. You know, I was reading in the airplane. Now, I always have considered myself rather a man of the world to know and understand it. And how many of you have ever heard of Botox? <laughs> I've heard of Botox. Do you know, I was reading in the, new, in, in the plane, and I, I knew that you used Botox to pump things up and make them better and look better. It's happening in people's lives. They're using it to get rid of their wrinkles on their face. You all are looking at me like I should have known that, but it just seemed to me that that was kind of an odd thing. And then I read in the, in, the, in, the, in the magazine that it works for about two months. And then you have to do it again. And if you don't, the wrinkles that come back are worse. So I'm thinking to myself, that's kind of a pain. You're better off with keeping your old wrinkles. So did everybody write something on their bulletin, something they want to change? How many of you have followed directions and written something? Any of you? All right. Well, I want you to write it down. I want you to take it home with you because God is interested in change too. In fact, that's what the message of Pentecost is about, my friends. It's about change. Now, in Sunday school, we had a split decision. I said, how many of you like change? And three hands went up, and five hands stayed down. Because, quite frankly, most people don't like change. Most people like to keep things the way they are, even when they're bad. I've never understood that. But studies show that people are more likely to stay in a bad situation, no matter what it is, even if a way out is presented. Why is that? It's because 
the act of change makes us think that we might be trading one bad thing for another bad thing. Most of us don't think that we can change from a bad thing to a good thing. Most of us do think that we can change from good things to bad things. You never did understand why isn't that reciprocal? Why can't we choose to change to good things? It has to do with how we think. It has to do with our inability to really change from deep down in inside. Now the day of Pentecost comes, I'm going to tell you, to change the world. God's interested in changing our world. He's interested in changing you. He's interested in changing me. And maybe most importantly, God is interested in changing us together. We live in a fractured world. We live in a world that is going 50 zillion different directions. And we wonder why things can't happen, why lives can't be changed. Well, if you listen to Valerie read the story of Pentecost, we've read two-thirds of it, you're assigned the rest of chapter 2 this week. There are two changes that happen on Pentecost Sunday. And the first change is the change that occurred for the disciples or believers that day. You know, there they were, waiting. Jesus had said, wait here until something happens. He wasn't even really specific. He said, God's going to send the Comforter. God's going to send the Holy Spirit. And when God sends the Holy Spirit, you'll know what to do. So the disciples... We're being obedient. They were waiting. How many of you like to wait? How many of you buy those tickets to Six Flags to go stand in those lines? That's why you go. Isn't that what it, the thrill is? The line? No. No. In fact, Six Flags figured it out. Now you can buy a pass to get to the front of the line. I don't know about you, but that's pretty brilliant. I love it. Unless you're, and everybody loves it, unless you're in the other line. And you see those people go, whoop, and you go, why didn't we do that? Well, you know, that extra money, that extra time, that extra whatever gets in the way. Well, on Pentecost Sunday, the disciples were waiting. And all of a sudden, the Spirit showed up. Now, I don't know if you really got the impact from Valerie's reading, because she reads it really nicely and unobtrusively, so you can follow along. But in reality, what she said was that the wind came into the room like a train! Understand that. It was a loud wind, a roaring wind. It's not even a tornado, it's louder. It's like standing next to the freight train as the engine goes by with the horns blowing three feet from the train track. Shaking. That's what's happened on Pentecost Sunday. A loud and roaring wind. And better than that, there's a visual image. I've been working on this for years and years. I can't make it happen. Tongues of fire come down from heaven inside the building. Keith's really glad I haven't figured out how to do that. <laughs> Tongues of fire. A loud and rushing wind. Eleven disciples sitting around waiting. Well, let me tell you what happened because of that. The disciples were changed. They were changed in a moment.
because they were obedient and they were ready and they were waiting. The disciples' lives were changed and they moved from confusion to confidence, from timidity to boldness, from fearfulness to courageous, and from closed door belief to open hearted faith in action. They were moved. And they began to tell the story. They started to speak the good news. They moved out of the house and into the community. And all of a sudden, people from all over the world began to hear these 12, 11 men telling the good news in their own language. It does not say that Peter spoke 73 languages. It says that all of those places that Valerie read about who speak languages other than Greek heard the good news in their own language. It was a miracle. It was powerful. People's lives were being changed. Here are these 11 men from Judea speaking the good news and everybody in town was hearing it in their own language. I don't know about you, but that's pretty amazing to me. How many of you think that would be a cool thing? You know, of course, see, here, here in our building, we don't really care as long as it comes out in English. In fact, if it comes out in something other than English, we're going to be very concerned. The crowd gathered. The people from all over the world heard the good news. And the disciples were changed. Now there's good news in that because guess who most of you are in this story? Most of us in this story are the disciples. Turn and look at a neighbor and say, you're a disciple. If you're a believer in Jesus, you're a disciple. And that means you've been waiting for God to speak through you so people all over Waukegan and Gurney and Lake County can hear the good news. Oh, sorry, and Kenosha. Sorry, we've got to get above the border. That's right, we love those people in Wisconsin. <laughs> people stood up and spoke God's word. Now Peter gets credit for it. Says Peter spoke a sermon. But it wasn't just Peter. You have to go back to the very beginning of the text. All of the disciples spoke the good news. And people all over Jerusalem heard it. And because people from all over the world were in Jerusalem, people all over the world received the good news. It's really the first missionary act of God in Acts chapter 2. And that day, the second change happened. 3,000 people heard the good news and turned to Jesus. 3,000 people came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives. 3,000 people who had never probably even heard of Jesus, came to know Him as Lord and Savior. 3,000 people had their whole way of looking at God, their whole way of looking at themselves changed. Three thousand. Now some of you remember when, when you first came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. That was the day of change. That was the day that the Holy Spirit came to live in you forever. You were changed. 
There is a problem. And here's the problem. Because see, once you get past that first change, once you get past that first coming into the kingdom change, one of the problems that we run up against is that we think we don't need to change anymore. Now, how many of you think you're done changing? I think some of you aren't telling the truth. Here's how I know. I know because some of you in this room probably haven't changed in the last 40 years. One of the reasons I had everybody move forward is so you can all experience change. <laughs> And some of you grumbled all the way up. <laughs> now some of you, went, all right, I'm going to have somebody, you know, when Randy was sitting here, he was going, all right, somebody's going to be close enough I can see. Of course, then he moved. I don't know what you all did to Randy, but. The very act of change scares and frightens and intimidates a lot of us. How do I know? I know because we say things like, I think I'm all right the way I am. What do I need to change about myself? You know, sometimes, I want, I want to say that sometimes as individuals, and I think even as a church, sometimes we're exceedingly selfish. That it's about us. That, that, you know, Jesus came and saved me and that's all that really matters. Now, we would never say that. We would never say that out loud or publicly. But think about some of the things we do sometimes. Think about how oftentimes the church is the last institution in the world to change. It is, by the way. In fact, more and more studies are being done that show that the 10.30, 11 o'clock holy worship hour in America continues to be the most racially segregated time in America. We say we're not racially motivated. You know, sometimes in the church we still misunderstand God's direction. Now, I don't claim to understand God's direction all the time, but there are some things from God that I understand all the time. Sometimes we're still timid in our faith. How many of you have known that somebody needed you to invite them to church, but you just couldn't bring yourself to do it? That's me. And I'm not very timid. You know, there are people out there that scare me, though. There are people out there that really needed me to speak to them. And I'm guessing that that's true. Sometimes we're still locked as a church and as individuals in old ways of thinking. I love history. I really do. I, I love history and learning the history. But one of the things that I've learned is that oftentimes war happens because we're not willing to change. Sometimes war in church happens because we're not willing to change. Sometimes war happens in a country like the United States in our civil war because groups of people are unwilling to change. You see, it isn't just the church, it's countries and people and families. How many of you know of families that are split because they refuse to change? Because we think oftentimes we don't have to change. But that's not why the Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit comes only to change the world. And that 
means the last time I looked that you and I are included. Because we're all in the world together. God has called us to be different. To be changed. So how do we do that? You know, when I asked the, at the beginning how um, we tried to better ourselves, Sheila very excitedly says, we try to change ourselves by working harder. I love that. In church, that's a disease. We work hard. Well, change doesn't usually come from working hard. Change comes when from inside we open ourselves up to what God's telling us to do and do. In Sunday school, we're talking about that in terms of spiritual gifts, how God has gifted us to live and have our being in the church. Saying that we're going to work harder at it is like saying there's something wrong with my car, but I'll try to change that by being a better driver. When you need someone to work on your engine, it doesn't do any good to practice how you steer. So the Pentecost story is about change. And we learn that change happens when we worship together. Change happens when we gather at the baptismal and bring people into the fellowship. Change happens when we gather here at this table to celebrate what Jesus did for us on the cross. Change happens when we work together to tell the story of the good news. You see, if there are only 11 disciples out there preaching on that first Pentecost Sunday, and there were at least 3,000 people who heard it, how do you think they did that? How do you think that really happened? I have a vision that Dr. Reed from my college days gave us. He says, it was highly likely that the the disciples were actually dispersed, and as Peter preached, they each repeated it from one person to the next. So I would hear it, so Jim would say it, and so back and forth and back and forth, and it extended down the streets and into the courtyards around Jerusalem where the people could gather. Because they did not have these wonderful microphones and speakers, they had to, to hold on to the words as they were shared. And still, people heard in their own language. How amazing that is. As the body of Christ, Pentecost empowers us for the changes we need to make as people and as a church. It's about change, but not just for the sake of change, but for the sake of growth. For the sake of becoming who God has called us to be. For the sake of becoming God's people of intentional grace. For the sake of becoming a community of intentional grace. For the sake of the whole world, our world, everywhere we are. So let the Spirit come today. And let our lives.